maybe we'll just sort of let people pop on and just go ahead and get started. Um, and I'll just do a quick introduction because I think we're really looking forward to um, hearing from you, Robin, and, and having some discussion about um, experimental vaccine trials, experimental medicine vaccine trials. Um, and, you know, I think getting your perspectives, Robin, on what, what this what this kind of means for the HIV vaccine field. And, um, you know, I think for us as advocates and community representatives, how you kind of see this as um, really being, I think, beneficial to kind of the design and development of, of an HIV vaccine. Um, and again, just really excited for that conversation. Um, I think just as an introduction, um, and I'm going to do a quick Zoom storm just because we do want this to be very informal and very participatory. Um, it's nice to see people's um, faces, it, but you, there's no video, there's no kind of requirement um, or pressure for video, but we do, um, we are hoping that, um, I know that there are some questions kind of swirling around in kind of amongst the sort of advocacy community. Um, and so we're really hoping that this can be sort of a, a chance to, to kind of have that conversation. I think it does seem, you know, kind of from my perspective, the bits and pieces that I've been involved in, it does seem like this is sort of a, um, a significant conversation right now for the HIV vaccine field. Um, and in, you know, I think the couple of webinars that the um, that the HIV vaccine enterprise had earlier this year, a lot of kind of community and ethics um, issues were were raised, and you know, I think a lot of issues that are kind of key to community. And um, you know, it really struck me that even in those calls, the community didn't necessarily have too much of a of a voice, and it you know, it doesn't seem like there's been a very much engagement with um, with with kind of, especially I think this sort of broader advocacy group. Um, and so we're hoping that this can be kind of a first step in that process. We did, Robin, We um, just to give you a little bit of an orientation to who's on the call today, we did, we thought about sort of opening this kind of um, to a wide audience as AVAC normally does, kind of, a, uh, you know, we do a lot of these sort of public conversations. But I think given that this is such a kind of, um, it's, you know, it's technical and I think that there's, there are a lot of ins and outs. We decided to keep this initial conversation just with sort of a key group. Um, and so we have on the call um, a number of AVAC, AVAC staff, kind of AVAC programmatic staff who, um, who have worked and are working around um, kind of advocacy and engagement and preparedness in specifically in that clinical trial space. Um, and then AVAC has convened, um, I think sort of in the wake of like next generation prep trials, we we convened a kind of an informal group uh, call it in, that we called sort of loosely called the Trial Design Academy to kind of engage similarly in these sort of next generation trial designs. Um, and so we opened this up to that group as well. And then we also have um, colleagues from the, from the HVTN, um, Gail Broder and Stefan Wallace, who you probably um, no, and Gail, um, I know we emailed a little bit back and forth and we're interested, I'm definitely interested to hear from you if you've done any sort of community kind of engagement around um, the experimental vaccine trials that are happening, um, experimental medicine vaccine trials uh, that are happening within kind of the HVTN network. So that's kind of the scope for, for this call. Um, and then, you know, Robin, maybe I'll just quickly kind of, I'll just sort of as a, well, actually, as a first step, um, well, I'll introduce you, Robin. I think um, I think many people are familiar, you know, especially those of us who have been in kind of the HIV vaccine advocacy space for a, for a while, sort of know you. Um, uh, but uh, Professor Robin Shattuck comes from the um, Imperial College London, and he heads uh, he's the head of mucosal infection and immunity um, in the Department of Medicine there, um, and. And I will say that, you know, as at AVAG, we've sort of, we pay attention to, to, to Robin quite a bit because we feel, you, you know, you're a real kind of superstar in the vaccine field. We also know that you are um, maybe a little known fact that you are a member of, or were a member of a rock band and so superstar in many, many ways. But I think you, you head up really, really interesting um, 
a, a, a huge body of really interesting HIV vaccine uh, research that is, I think, less known to advocates because it's quite kind of, you know, what we call sort of upstream, um, really trying to, really looking at kind of initial sort of design and developing candidates that can actually get into clinical trials. So um, we'd love to learn more about that. And that can be another conversation for another time. But um, Robin, I think that it's safe to say you've really been at the forefront of this idea of experimental medicine for HIV vaccine research. And so um, with that, uh, I will hand it over to you. Great. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, a privilege and exciting to talk to you all today. Um, and I'm going to present some slides. Um, at the end, I've got some questions that actually Stacy sent to me. Um, and I'm going to ask you to give answers and we'll see if your answers agree with mine. So make sure you have a piece of paper and a pen ready because you've got to do some work as well. So this, this is true knowledge, knowledge uh, teaching, um, as it were. That doesn't mean that I've got all the right answers. It's more about sharing opinions. And I'm very conscious that when we talk about experimental medicine vaccine trials, when you draw anything out, it sounds like this is, this is something different to the normal. Um, and so people start saying, oh, what's this? This is, this is strange. Actually, I don't think it's that different to much of what we do in the vaccine space every day, but it is a bit of a change of emphasis for HIV. So while it sounds like something new, many of the, many of the concepts and particularly things like the ethical side are probably not as challenging as you might first suspect. Quick disclaimer, these are my views. Uh, don't, don't reflect policy of anybody else. Um, that means you can agree or disagree, um, and disagreeing is often just as good as agreeing. Um, it, it's meant to, my presentation is meant to uh, stimulate thinking and discussion rather than be definitive. So, I mean, experimental medicine trials is, is not actually a new concept. It's been used in medicine for, for decades but also in terms of vaccination studies and understanding human immunology um, for really several decades um, beyond the context of just HIV. Um, and perhaps it's been less used in a standout sense in HIV, although I think it's still being used in HIV as well. So, you know, some examples of the way people use experimental medicine to understand about the human immune system is taking a licensed vaccine, it's approved, and you're using that to understand uh, a scientific concept about how the immune system works. And two examples would be a, a relatively recent study looking at lymph node activation, people wanting to understand what happens in the lymph node to understand immune responses. Um, this was in 27 participants. They were adult women. And so really the benefit from getting the HPV vaccine as, as adults um, is, is probably, uh, there's probably you know, very little benefit because we know for the vaccine to give clinical benefit, it needs to be uh, given uh, before sexual debut in, in early teenage years. So it answered a scientific question. It didn't put the patients, the subjects, the participants at risk because it was a licensed vaccine, but it had limited be benefit to those participants. And another example would be another uh, germinal center type of approach um, that also looked at uh, using a licensed vaccine. Um, and, and there are many, many examples of these types of approaches of using vaccine candidates to answer scientific questions, but not necessarily benefiting the, the participant. So what about in the context of uh, product development? So again, human uh, immunology has benefited from studies that are allied to clinical trials. So uh, two examples here would be in terms of uh, one of the mRNA vaccines against SARS-CoV-2, um, allied along the efficacy trials, phase ones, phase two, people did a lot of human immunogenicity, which was not part of the trial, 
in order to understand the immune response. Um, and again, we have two examples there. So here there were benefit to the participants because they were getting vaccinated, but the primary uh, endpoint of those trials was not to develop a vaccine, but to address scientific uh, principles and questions. So when we, when we think about experimental medicine vaccine trials, and I, I've put the V in there, we often, sometimes just say experimental medicine trials, but I think it's important to have the vaccine part, is that uh, I would say the definition is a clinical investigation undertaken to test or generate a scientific hypothesis that advances vaccine discovery or development but provides no direct prophylactic or therapeutic benefit to the participant. And that in that context, the participant really is contributing to the research and their contribution may lead ultimately to a, a, a vaccine, um, but they may not get a benefit from something that is addressing a scientific question that needs to be resolved in order to get to a product. So there can still be a high level of motivation, but we are not uh, developing a product in its, in its uh, conventional sense. Now this isn't that much a move away from a phase one trial of a new HIV vaccine because we never know whether any vaccine will actually work. Um, and we're all familiar with enrolling people and having to uh, inform them in order to get appropriate consent that we're trying a vaccine. It may or may not work. Um, there's no guarantee that this vaccine will give benefit. Um, we're just one step removed with an experimental medicine trial where we're saying we think it's very unlikely that it would provide any benefit. Uh, we're doing this to address a scientific concept. So um, how do these differ from conventional vaccine approaches? Uh, essentially, you're, in these trials, we're not doing product development, um, which would be a normal progress from a phase one clinical trial that was specifically designed to generate the data required to go to a phase two, which would be expanded safety, and then to a large scale efficacy. The, the primary endpoint is focusing on accelerating vaccine science rather than individual products. Now, that means that the outcome may not be that you go into further clinical development of that product, but you address certain questions that then uh, go back into further refinement of the vaccine or vaccine candidates. So there's little or no expectation that any particular vaccine in an experimental medicine trial will progress further. It may, because we, you might discover something that said, actually, this candidate or candidates merit further development, but there's no expectation that that will actually happen. So one thing that is important because I hear this mentioned a lot. People get very confused between experimental medicine vaccine trials and phase zero trials. And phase zero trials are, are a particular type of trial that um, deals by and large with drugs, uh, mainly in the cancer space, and is related to microdosing. So if you are developing a new drug, and you want to understand whether it's having any impact on a target, you can do a phase one trial uh, and check whether your drug at, at sub therapeutic levels is hitting your target. And that's one way of de-risking development. There is no equivalent of a phase zero trial in the vaccine space. So uh, if you hear people talking about phase one, phase zero trials in the vaccine space, the two things just don't go together. Um, so it's important to, to recognize that that, that that pathway is not there for vaccines. So back to the clinical definition, um, 
This is my definition. Other people may have slightly different definitions. There isn't one that's been uh, you know, decided and, and approved uh, by everybody in terms of this is the ultimate definition. But I think it, it still falls down on that no direct prophylactic or therapeutic benefit to the participant. So, so why would you even go there? Um, and, and why now? Well, I think part of the why now is because many of the candidates that we've taken into large scale efficacy trials have uh, failed to deliver the level of protection that we would think was meaningful um, in terms of solving the big challenge of developing therapeutic or prophylactic vaccines. And so uh, I think it's increasingly become recognized that animal models aren't fully predictive of human responses. Um, and one of those reasons is that particularly in terms of the antibody responses, the B cell responses, the, that really differs between species. So the, uh, what we call your germline, your DNA, um, in terms of the genetic sequences that can respond uh, for antibody responses are completely different to a mouse, a rat, uh, a primate. Um, there are similars, similarities, but it means that ultimately to know if a vaccine will work, you need to look at it in, in humans. And so one of the reasons for getting into human studies early is that it allows you to understand whether you're you're talking to human B cells, because otherwise there can be a lot of wasted time testing concepts uh, and no feedback loop from the human studies. Whereas if you are doing human studies, you can then better interpret how the preclinical models are predicting what might happen in clinical trials. The other aspect is that it's becoming increasingly difficult to do phase three vaccine trials for HIV. Um, part of that is the fantastic success in all the different prevention technologies that we have out there. Um, you know, it's not the landscape of 20 years ago or, or even 30 years ago. Um, any trial now will increasingly have to be larger because hopefully we will get better and better at driving down incidents. Um, and if we don't, uh, we should be asking ourselves why that's not the case. So that means that the cost of efficacy trials will become much higher, and therefore we need to ensure that we're really certain of what we put into those trials has a higher chance of success. And, and in industry, people often talk about fly or die, testing a concept early, um, to kill it if it's really not worth moving forward and not getting sucked into the temptation of having built a trials network that you just need to fill it up with candidates to support the network where they may not necessarily have the scientific validity for moving forward. And then uh, logistically, I, I think we probably all agree we need to accelerate HIV vaccine development. Um, you know, everybody's pointing the finger at COVID and saying, wow, you did that in, in you know, record time. Why aren't you doing that for HIV? We all recognize it's not the same issue, um, but the landscape is changing um, in terms of investment into vaccine R&D. Um, I think there is a, a, you know, a danger that, that Funding commitments are moving towards pandemic preparedness. HIV is moving into a chronic long-term problem for the world that many are questioning whether the vaccine piece is solvable. Um, and therefore we need to accelerate what we're doing and the science that we're doing to move it forward. And then the last one is, is ethical. Um, I think, again, it, it shouldn't be controversial to say, we need to ensure that in late stage, late stage trials, we need to increase the probability of success. 
So what about the approach? Um, they are designed, they should be designed to accelerate HIV vaccine development um, and increasing the probability of products that then move into clinical evaluation. They should be addressing questions that are not capable of being solved in animal models. Um, humans obviously are the best model of humans. Um, that they can provide this, this what, what I often call paraclinical approach, where you can be doing things in the preclinical and the cl clinical stage. Um, so, for example, um, that doesn't mean jumping doing the preclinical toxicology, but it could mean that you are testing in an early phase trial clinical candidates at the same time as perhaps looking at their protective utility in a non-human primate model, um, rather than doing those as se sequential approaches. It certainly provides, if it works, validation um, of novel design strategies, and that validation can then um, hopefully leverage new funding to get behind them. It can uh, evaluate those novel concepts. And uh, again, perhaps in terms of, sorry, uh, in terms of the, the type of design, because these trials typically are smaller in size, they allow for more intense sampling, perhaps more involved sampling than you would be able to do in a large scale trial. Um, therefore, often one is asking more of the participants um, and that means uh, perhaps more in terms of informed consent, but also potential comp compensation. Um, in terms of their time and their involvement in a trial where they're not getting uh, any uh, benefit from the trial itself. So I've put together in this table and, and you know, I'll make the slides available uh, for people to, to look at it, but really this is just showing the potential differences between a traditional phase one and an experimental phase one. And you can see right at the top, the main difference is one is all about product development. So the primary endpoint in any phase one is safety. Um, that's not that an experimental medicine trial is unsafe, but the uh, most important endpoint of a phase one is collecting the safety data that is required to then move into a phase two trial. Whereas the most important question in a phase one, sorry, in an efficacy experimental medicines trial is gaining the, answering the scientific question. Um, and you can see uh, along the rest, a, a lot of the things are very similar. And by and large, in most parts of the world, uh, experimental medicine trials still need to be conducted under phase one guidelines. So, for example, in the US, the FDA would still say uh, an experimental medicine trial that was answering a scientific question is still conducted under phase one guidelines. Uh, that's true in, in, in Europe and in most parts of the world. There are some exceptions, uh, the UK being one, uh, Australia being another, um, and, and there may be a, a few others that uh, I'm unaware of where there is an exemption to actually recognize that what we call a non-CTIMP trial, so a trial of a, of a, a non-vaccine uh, candidate that's going to provide benefit um, can be done outside of the phase one setting. So I wanted to give you a, a couple of quick examples so we know what we're talking about. Um, and one example would be, for example, looking at an immunogen that is targeting uh, naive or germline B cells. Um, and that would be, for example, the EOD GT8 vaccine candidate that uh, Bill Sheath at Scripps has been working at. And this vaccine candidate on its own is addressing a scientific question as to whether that immunogen can activate naive B cells but there is no expectation that it will induce neutralizing antibodies that would be protective. 
So if somebody is enrolled in that phase one trial, one would have to consent them and say, we are testing a scientific concept. This may be part of a vaccine in the future, but in its own right, it will provide no benefit to you. Um, this is already being done under a phase one uh, clinical trial setting. And so, you know, if you think about um, the approaches that people are considering, um, shown on this left-hand side, where you may need a series of immunogens, that trial is essentially looking at that first step, whether that first immunogen can speak to the naive B cells and kick it up to the next stage. Um, and so this would be an experimental medicine trial conducted under a phase one uh, infrastructure. In some exceptional parts of the world, it could be done outside of a phase one. But it's pretty clear to recognize that this trial is not going to get you to a neutralizing antibody and so will not provide benefit to those participants. And it may be that the outcome of that trial is that you validate that first scientific question and you come back with a second experimental medicine trial where you start to understand what the next step is and you might investigate a range of other vaccine candidates that can move it from step one to step two um, and so the cycle may go round. Uh, we can come back at the end as to whether this iterative cycle can be done quick enough um, but this is the type of uh, experimental medicine approaches that are now coming through the pipeline uh, and flowing into clinical programs. Another example would be uh, where you have a, uh, a portfolio of um, trimers, uh, envelope trimers that you wish to look at in a range of different studies to see how they can improve our understanding of what's required to give neutralizing breadth. Um, if they are all manufactured through a, a single pathway that's the same for each product, they can be supported by a single pivotal toxicology package, therefore saving time and money. Um, and again, what would those studies look like? Well, uh, it might be, for example, that you have an experimental study that looks at four immunogens in series or uh, experimental medicine trial that looks at them as combinations or a third trial that looks at them in, in different combinations where you introduce more as you give different vaccine uh, immunization strategies. In all of those studies, we have uh, no uh, understanding whether they will get to any level of neutralization breadth, but by performing those trials, we will get a much uh, better insight as to how we can start to navigate the pathways that are required to move towards neutralization breadth. Now, I focused on examples with uh, B cell immunogens but you could come up with the same constructed argument for T cell immunogens or combining, combining the both, the two. So are the potentials for saving time and money? Now, you know, money is perhaps not the most important driver. Time definitely is um, because the time to realize an effective prophylactic or therapeutic vaccine um, is pressing. Um, we're all aware that we've been at this for well, far, far more time than we would like. Um, and yet the, the need for an HIV vaccine hasn't gone away. So one of the things that makes saves time is having a, a generic manufacturing process. Um, in, in Europe, we've done this for recombinant proteins. Obviously some of the new technologies like RNA, because of their speed for production and the small footprint, should accelerate that approach. Uh, and so platform technology could be very useful to the HIV field. That's not to say that a particular platform is going to solve the problem. So, you know, uh, probably many of you have heard story, you know, people saying, oh, mRNA is going to solve HIV vaccines. It may be a tool that helps us solve the scientific problems. But until those scientific challenges are resolved, 
no platform is going to be the solution. They may be a tool to help us uh, come to that solution. Obviously, being able to make smaller scale batches um, can both reduce time and cost. It allows you to have those gen generic release and stability criteria um, and a pivotal toxicology to underpin the studies. But perhaps the most uh, effective way of saving time is by having parallel rather than sequential trials. Very much in the clinical space, we're used to you know, going from phase one to phase two to phase three to phase four, um, rather than having uh, a, a much more accelerated um, throughput at the early phase killing things if they don't look, uh, don't look effective, but also being able to go back and redesign uh, through rounds of iteration before we get to a really uh, promising product to then take through into the later stage trials. That product development can be accelerated. Um, sometimes small is better than large, um, and that really is based around uh, decision-making um, few administrative tiers, um, and just being able to move uh, more flexibly. Um, and so that, that's really a, a process approach rather than anything else. Um, and again, others may not necessarily buy into that small is better. Um, there's also an argument that experience and breadth um, can also accelerate approaches. Now, what are the challenges? Well, one of them uh, <coughs> potentially is regulatory. Um, it's only a challenge if one wants to move outside of the phase one framework. And by and large, um, I think, particularly when we think about using this type of trial approach in low and middle income countries, it would make most sense to stay within that phase one framework because uh, I suspect if the FDA struggles with moving outside of a phase one framework, other regulatory authorities are going to be equally or more challenged. That is not to say that people of influence or bodies of influence shouldn't be challenging the likes of the FDA to look at this space and perhaps review uh, the the rules around the approach, um, because I'm always, uh, I always feel that, that uh, dogma should be challenged and there are always alternative ways of doing things. The other one is, uh, the other challenges are, are financial, um, because uh, unless one is looking at different ways of manufacturing, it can still be very costly logistical because it does uh, mean that people need to be more adaptable um, and one needs to communicate better to community and ethical bodies uh, around both the state of HIV vaccine research and the need to do these types of trials that don't necessarily provide benefit to the volunteers. Um, and, you know, We've all seen where this has been done badly. Um, obviously, one always wants to avoid the idea that people are just being used as guinea pigs for scientific research. Um, I think this can be done well. Um, I think it does require engaging volunteers to feel that they're invested in being part of the research team that they are, they are benefiting, they are a research partner rather than a participant in a trial where they may get benefit. Um, and I'm sure all of you probably have much more experience around effective communication. Um, and, and I think this, you know, the reason we're having this discussion today is to, to get uh, more understanding and, and a broader, uh, broader thinking around how we communicate these issues. So one of the things is, this is only worth doing if it makes the science faster. 
Um, and so a lot needs to be done in the design space, but also in the conceptual space, perhaps uh, from the, the researchers, but also the funders to think, think about where they want to get to and the timelines of getting there and how to make that quicker. So I haven't put this example in, but in one of the um, IAS presentations, I went through the current timeline, if you mapped out for doing sequential studies to look at how long it would take to understand uh, a germline uh, prime boost, boost, boost scenario. And it stretched out well into 2040, which I think for any of us would recognize it is, is really not where we want to be. Um, but I think those kind of timeline uh, views are, are rarely communicated. But if one starts from where you want to be and work back and then start saying, well, how do you do it faster? Um, it changes the discussion. And actually, I think perhaps this is my own personal opinion, you know, advocates should be challenging the scientists and the funders to say, how can you do things quicker? Um, because it's quite easy to get caught up in the science, which is exciting, and not in the urgency of delivering an effective vaccine. So one of the approaches is really to think about doing trials in parallel that are addressing key scientific uh, parameters and all, uh, almost to, to have this as a, as a very aggressive uh, approach um, that then spins out when it's ready and the evidence is right, products that go into phase one to phase three development. Um, it does require a change in focus. It also requires a change in bringing uh, candidates to clinical evaluation quickly. So um, ah, I've got all my answers up there at the same time. I didn't get that, get that right. So these are uh, Stacey's questions. So um, the first one is, what are the distinctions between first in human experimental trials and a standard phase one? And that's my answer. But uh, I'm interested to know whether people would define it differently. So would people think that that, that is a fair um, understanding or do, do people find that a, a difficult definition to support? Mitchell. So Robin, um, first of all, fantastic presentation. I've seen you and others present um, experimental medicine several times, but just beautifully done. I just have a, a question about your question. Um, you you introduce here that it's you have the first in human experimental trial. Are you differentiating between a first in human? I mean, because the way I heard you describe it, it doesn't. I I wouldn't have thought it had to be a first in human. Or, or do you mean that each it experimental medicine because you're you're iterating on it with each additional study that it's always a first in human no it, it doesn't have to be a first in human um uh, that that was a copy and paste from from stacy um so it could well be that it it's been you know you've got an immunogen and, and actually we're seeing this for example some of the um stabilized trimers we've made in the european program we're now putting into other clinical studies mm -hmm. Um, that they're, they're becoming research tools and actually as research tools and you're building up your safety database that also makes it easier to move, move them into a wider range of trials. So they can be things that have never been, um, they can be things that have been used before. Um, of course, if you're using a platform technology, it also makes it easier. Yep. So if I'm making 20 stabilized trimers using the same manufacturing process, the same release criteria, and mm -hmm. I go to the regulators, they're not asking me to do a toxicology study Got for it. all 20. Robin, this is, this is Bill Snow. I have a question. Uh, your answer seems to indicate that you might be able to jump past phase one if you, if you wanted to move forward. 
Is that true? Oh, that's that's a uh, no. That isn't true. If well, it depends actually. If your experimental medicine trial is done under f the phase one framework, then it would still accrue the phase one safety data. So if you were, let's say, we were lucky and we took something in that we didn't think would give us broadly neutralizing antibodies, and just by serendipity, we suddenly found we got a level of breadth that excited everybody, you could move that into a phase two. If so, you used it outside of that phase one uh, infrastructure, you would still have to go back and do a phase one. So what about the manufacturing and what about the number of participants? Uh, that's uh, another good question. Um, so yes, you might have to, so you might have to do more work around the manufacturing um, and depending on the size of the trial, you might have to include more participants. But I, I suspect in terms of the participant question, you would just do a, you know, an expanded role into a phase two. So rather than being a stop start, um, it would be perhaps accruing more to your phase one, but, but as part of rolling into your phase two. That's very exciting. Thank you. Yeah. And I would just, Robin, this was lovely. I agree with everything that you presented and it's totally in line with what the HVTN is doing in our XMED program. I think to your first bullet point and the question you posed, I, my sense is that it's not just um, a first in human design to discover products that you then move into product development, but it's also this idea of um, questions about manufacture, questions about methods of vaccine delivery. Um, so it, it may not even necessarily be linked to the product per se, but rather how that product is delivered, how that product is made. Um, so for example, we have one of our studies um, that's about to, um, uh, well, it's about to be distributed to the sites. It'll open up probably in uh, another couple of months. Um, that's looking at an idea called fractionated dosing. That's, um, you know, a, a different delivery of vaccine than we've done in the past. So I, I think perhaps your first response there in the blue is, maybe a little narrow, but I definitely agree with where your thinking as you've just presented it is going. I, I think we, we would agree. Um, and I think that's that's an, a, the beautiful example in that, you know, fractional dosing will address a really important question, but you could do that with an immunogen that may not merit further development on in its own right. Um, I'm, I'm going to flip to the second set of questions because I suspect, as everybody does, they've read the question and answer quicker than I would read them out. <laughs> uh, this was my, my other set. Um, and uh, I think one of the key things is why now and how does it fit, fit into the bigger picture? And I, and I would suggest that, that, that currently we are in a phase of resetting the research agenda. Um, I think we have had several resets over the last 30 years. We've heard back to basics before after the last, last 30 years, um, but I think that's where we are right now. Um, although I suspect what we're doing is not so different to what we've done in the past, we're just highlighting it more as being slightly different. And could I, could I actually build on that? Um and ask, ask sort of a, a, a follow-up to that, because I think that that, I think this idea of sort of, you know, resetting, even though it's something that has happened in the vaccine field, and, you know, we definitely have experience with it and all of the above, I think it might be something that is a little bit hard for advocates and, you know, communities, and I think, as you mentioned, potentially even funders to kind of to swallow. And one thing that I wonder is if we're kind of going back to basics and looking at, you know, 
whether it's sort of a full kind of, you know, mapping of experimental medicine trials throughout the vaccine field, or whether it's kind of these specific programs like you, um, like some of, you know, some of your examples. Um, are we, are there lessons learned from the candidates that have gone through that full kind of, you know, whatever, however you want to term it, the product development process, or have gone through efficacy trials that can feed back into an experimental medicine approach in vaccines, HIV vaccines? So, yeah. Stacey, oh, sorry, Robin. No, no, go ahead. You're, you're most welcome. Uh, I, I was just thinking that that's exactly what's happening in the HVTN. So, okay. you know, what we've seen, for example, with the results of the AMP study data is that we really now have verification that broadly neutralizing antibodies are important. And so doing a number of experimental medicine studies with a variety of products and adding in one of the things Robin didn't say a lot about is that many of the XMED studies involve other kinds of procedures for the participant. So we're doing leukapheresis, we're doing um, mm -hmm. fine needle aspiration, um, lymph node biopsies. So we're, we're looking more specifically at um, these like targeted germline kinds of questions. Is this a vaccine that actually we can see something happening in B cell reservoirs because we're actively looking for it? And so I think we're already seeing that sort of feedback loop of, mm. you know, AMP, AMP told us BNABs are important. So now we need to come back and actively look for them. Uh, and I think hearing you read back what I'm saying it, it, is like a feedback loop. And it immediately makes me think <laughs> I'm never going to use back to basics again. Because that, that <laughs> sounds like, you, you know, all everything that's gone before was thrown yeah. out as a waste of time. Uh -huh. Actually, what we're really saying is, is now we're moving to a phase where we recognize some of the challenges we hadn't recognized before, and we're, we're using this as a tool to address them, and also to avoid the, the mistake of saying that everything is about experimental medicine trials, because okay. it's, a, it's a tool to address some of these questions. That doesn't mean that we should stop conventional product development. Um, there may be products that merit developing. Um, it is a it's something that we need to bring as part of the the pro the, you know the portfolio of tools that are required to solve a problem. Perfect. Thank you. That's super helpful. And um, we have a couple hands raised, so maybe Jeannie will go to you. So I have I have two two things. Um, the first one is on your final question there on the slide. What's needed to ensure that experimental medicine actually accelerates. And I'm really picking up on the centrality of generic manufacturing and trying to really create some of these, you know, generic generic assays, all these kinds of things that are gonna speed development. And I'm wondering about the politics of that, right? So, you know, are we, is, is, is framing this strategy around experimental medicines do we see an opening there that that's uh, gonna kind of leverage arguments for generics? It just seems like that's a, a, a really significant political hurdle. And you know where are the openings gonna be? So that's not just for you to answer, Robin, it's for all of us to, to discuss, I suppose. But the other thing I wanted to throw out is I love this framing that you, you know, I'm really resonating with the framing around um, since there isn't gonna be a direct benefit to the participants that it's framed as partners in research. And in my mind, what I'm wondering about is, is there a way to give that more than just language? Is there a way to build that out with, you know, programmatic attributes that, so it's not just a matter of a messaging. And those are my two thoughts. So I'll try and respond to both of those. Um, the first one is, is about generics and, and what's needed. Um, I would say that the field is moving in that direction already, um, that you know, there, are, there are different global players. Um, and so you know, NIH is, is adapting their own, you know, their, their, their own uh, 
process towards this, and I think the Gates Foundation probably are. Um, I suspect that, that Europe will be slower because the funding cycles are very different. Um, probably, as with everything, we don't want everybody to do exactly the same um, because diversity is good. Um, so part of it is political. Part of it is, is commercial because many of these platforms are commercial platforms and those also come with uh, strengths and also often uh, with uh, some strings attached. Um, and the other side is the regulators. So the more one does with a platform, the more familiar and comfortable they get with the approach. And you know, looking at RNA vaccines, for an example, we've, we've only recently seen the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines come of, of age and be authorized uh, and licensed. Um, and so only recently have we started to build up a big safety, safety database for those. I suspect that the more we do with any of these technologies in HIV will increase the regulatory, regulatory comfort, whether that's in the US, which is probably easier, um, or Europe, but also in, in um, low middle income countries. The other aspect was research, research partners. I mean, I, I think this is definitely something one could build on. Um, I suspect, you know, others, including yourself, could work on this much better than me. But, you know, when we do research, anybody who's uh, part of the trial in terms of delivering the trial feels that they're part of that study. Um, and they get you know, credit out of being part of that study. We need to perhaps build on really integrating the participants into being research partners so they, they feel they own the outcome. Um, and I'm sure that there are creative ways of doing that. Yeah, thanks for that, Robin. And I think a lot of people on the call know it's sort of easier easier said than done said than done and I think that's what Jeannie was was alluding to but I think it's definitely sort of a to be continued um I know we're getting to the top of the hour and I definitely want to get through these hands raised so Sindra thanks Stacey oh, hi Robin I'm Sindra from AVAC um two things quickly one is this the earlier slide I think it said that these would be taking place mostly in in lower and middle income countries and that is a little counterintuitive to me because why would they need to be done there yes um, uh, but yeah so th that wasn't what i was implying i i think I, I can't remember what it was what i was trying to say is if in lower middle income countries they'd almost certainly need to be done under phase one mm -hmm. um i i am conscious that it's probably easier to do these studies um in europe and the us mm -hmm. but i think that culturally um, and in terms of what we should be doing, it would not be good that all these trials are being done outside of Africa um, and other parts of the world where HIV is really important, because you're then disengaging researchers, participants um, who would be most invested. So actually, I think there's, there really needs to be an effort to make sure that this doesn't all slip back into old ways of working where we do everything outside of uh, affected areas and then only come in with the Hail Mary trial at the end of the day. Great point. And then just quickly, I think that you can use, or maybe have you considered, but you can use the fact that this could possibly move us away from animal studies as, as an ethical um, asset or benefit or incentive. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm always doing that. Uh, I'm always trying to say that, 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 that it's important um, that we do that. Thank you. Great. And I know, Ethel, you had, um, you had your hand raised, and I know you put a question in the chat, but didn't, want, didn't know if you wanted to just come off, because I think it's a great question. Maybe do you want to come off mute and, and ask it? Mm. Yes, um, I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes. we can hear you. Great. Yes, so I'm Ethel from IRV, uh, Director for Advocacy Policy and Communications. And my question was that, you know, considering the time is, you know, essential in the experimental 
but the medicine vaccine trials, how much of a barrier is it when, when we, as you said, um, we have to work more often in the phase one framework? What, what is it, what does it cost to us in terms of you know, time and money? Okay, that, that's a good question. Um, my own experience, which is fairly unique working in the UK, is that we've been able to move faster outside of a phase one framework, not compromising on safety, but it does mean that you can, you know, change your trial design in flight. It's very easy to expand your trial um, again as you move ahead. And you're not bogging down clinical teams with collecting huge amounts of safety data, which will never, well, not never, but which are unlikely ever to be used. So you can focus your clinical team on addressing the scientific questions. So there are some savings there, um, but that doesn't mean that it, it can't be done under a phase one setting effectively. It's, it's more about, if you can have that opportunity, you can be leaner and faster, um, but you can also build the same speed, it just is more expensive. And maybe just quickly, I know we're at the very, very top of the hour, but, and you, I mean, I think that this presentation is so great because you do such a nice job of sort of laying out what the kind of pros and cons are, but just in specifically kind of answering this question, are there, then with sort of looking at the kind of the experimental medicine framework as opposed to the phase one, are, is there like a kind of a, a risk there? Is there sort of an inherent risk between those, those two? The only risk in the experimental medicine side is that you might discover something that was really attractive to move rapidly into mm. efficacy and you may have to waste a year or a couple of years doing you know backfilling with phase one and some of the manufacturing approaches i suspect that that would be a great challenge to have um, i mm. wouldn't be upset that if in an experimental <laughs> medicine study i suddenly solved or somebody suddenly solved the the question of how to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies I don't think that's going to be a major problem. Okay. I think that the much bigger problem is that I remain, and I and I think if if the scientific community is really open uh, and honest, uh, challenged by the time frames of solving these really big scientific challenges. Great. Thanks for that. So um, I just want to take a quick pause and um, I don't know if anyone has any sort of final kind of burning thoughts or questions before we sort of wrap up. Um, Mitchell, I, do you coming I, up? I just, Go ahead. I just want to say, Robin, I think that last point was so important. And as I put in the chat, it's a high quality problem. I wonder if one of the tasks, again, collaboratively with researchers like you and the VTN, IAVI, um, and with advocates to kind of lay out um, I think if people had a sense of here are all the questions we're asking in these experimental medicine studies, and if we get a really positive answer with one of them, yes, we might lose some time, but the fact that we're asking so many of them simultaneously and showing the robustness of the agenda, because I, I realize in just in, in hearing you present now a number of times on this, that We've talked, it's been a lot about the processes of the studies and, and, and what they are and using illustrations and, and perhaps having a comprehensive agenda that says, here is the suite of questions that, that we're all trying to navigate around. And then, you know, if we get a hugely successful answer to one of those, um, and it takes us an extra year, at least we know that the opportunity cost was we were asking nine other questions that we may not have done if we only did the phase one on something that we now know historically we've often asked, answered, and not succeeded. So I just wonder if there's a benefit in thinking about laying out the suite of questions collectively, um, and maybe that's happening in the field. I haven't seen it. Yeah, I think I think that would be something that would be really good to do. <laughs> and you know, this is Bill. It's actually one huge question, right? It's not 
a whole lot of different questions. Mm. One one huge question at the end of the day, but lots of little questions that that I think feed feed into that, which is what we've been. I think what we all kind of um, know are the challenges of HIV vaccine field. Um, so I, I, we're over the we're over time. I think we could. Um, I I have a, a, a ton more questions, um, but I think that this is a conversation that that will continue. And Robin, just again, um, just want to thank everyone for for joining here and um, for the great kind of the, for the great discussion. Um, but Robin, especially, thank you for. Um, I know that is a, it's kind of a crazy week for you. So thanks for taking the the hour and change out to spend with us. And um, you know and really just look forward, hoping that we can kind of continue to engage with you and with others as, as the conversation moves forward. My pleasure. Okay, great. Take care everyone and um, look forward to talking to everyone um, soon, soonish. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Ben. Cheers all, thank you so much, Robin. And great to see everybody. Bye. Bye all.